Hi there, everyone. My name is May Elliott, and I am the Marketing Assistant here at New Cloud Network. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar on Ransomware Preparedness and Recovery, brought to you by New Cloud Networks and Veeam. Today, you're going to hear from myself as well as Michael Deemer, a Veeam Solutions Engineer. If at any time during the webinar you have questions, please use the question feature on your screen, and all questions will be addressed at the end. So without further ado, I will go ahead and dive in. All right, so to kick things off, I want to really hit home with a few of the realities of what companies are facing when it comes to ransomware. So the truth is, we as humans tend to belittle the likelihood of an event occurring to us. We hear about ransomware attacks on the news, but we never think it will actually happen to us. But the reality is that ransomware attacks are expected to occur every five seconds in 2021. And this same statistic was every 11 seconds last year. So ransomware attacks are becoming much more frequent. And then, in fact, sources have said that in 2015, the loss due to ransomware attacks was $325 million, and by the end of this year, that number is expected to increase to $20 billion. And so, as I said before, it's so easy to say that a ransomware attack will never happen to you, especially for smaller enterprises. However, that is far from the truth, because 43% of online attacks are actually targeting small businesses. But because many of these organizations are under the false pretense that they aren't attracting hackers, only 14% of those are actually prepared to defend themselves. And that can result to catastrophic impact. And so lately, we've heard a lot about cyber, cyber criminals leveraging the uncertainties around COVID-19 to spread malicious emails disguised as information on stimulus checks or, you know, CDC guidelines, things like that. And all of this points towards the rise in attacks we saw in 2020 and what will continue in 2021. And along those same lines, and definitely heightened by COVID-19, another reality of ransomware is that while no one, no one industry is excluded, verticals like healthcare and financial services are especially at risk due to the sensitive data that they handle. And hackers know that for these companies, downtime means loss of life and loss of funds, which means that they likely they will likely get their payment quicker. And so the HIPAA journal says that at least 560 U.S. healthcare facilities were impacted by ransomware attacks in the last year. So at this point, now ask yourself this. What proactive methods do you have in place that will prevent an attack from damaging your business? And how confident are you in your ability to stop that attack? And if you can't stop it, how confident are you in your ability to recover from it? In reality, no one out there is immune from these threats. It's no longer if a ransomware attack will affect you, but when. So essentially, you can no longer afford to be unprepared. All right, there we go. So to put this all into perspective for you, let's take a look at a real world example of an attack. In May of 2019, the city of Baltimore was hit with a new strain of ransomware called Robinhood. All servers with the exception of essential services were taken offline and a ransomware and ransom totaling around $76,000 was demanded. So the city did not regain full functionality for over a month. And since the attack has pumped over $10 million into remediation, recovery, and the hardening of their IT environment. And meanwhile, the estimated loss in revenue and other damages in the aftermath of the attack equaled $8.2 million, which brought the total cost of the ransomware attack on the city to $18.2 million. So what happens when we face an attack? What are the costs? So there's always the monetary cost associated with attacks. Lost revenue due to downtime, customer attrition, retribution to affected parties, et cetera, all that stuff. But there's also the non-monetary cost we may not think about, like damage to your reputation. Essentially, the IDG tells us that this will all boil down to six trillion annually in damages in 2021. And we don't want your company to become part of that statistic. We want to help you prepare in order to minimize these costs as much as possible. All right, so at this point in the webinar, I'm going to now hand it over to Michael to go more in depth about ransomware. Sweet, thank you, May. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Deemer, systems engineer here for Beam Software. And I'll be really taking you through the deep dive on ransomware and what we can do to really prevent it. And actually kind of showing you some real life examples. Now, let's actually just kick this off here. Perfect. Let's see when it rolls over. One second. Let me try one more time here. Maybe. 
Hey, May, could you uh, redo the, um, the rights for me one more time, please? Yep, I could do it one more time for you. Perfect, thank you. All right, if you could just control the next slide for me. Yep, one second. Perfect. So let's actually kind of go over ransomware in the big picture. Uh, but really what I want to talk about is actually going to be like, what is ransomware, right? So um, if you could go to the next slide for me, please, May. You got it. All right, perfect. So what is ransomware? So I do want to give a big um, kind of overview look at actually what is like malicious software, malware um, that you kind of heard of maybe or, or sort of heard of you know, maybe over, you know, radio or anything, you know, that you've heard around software, right? So what is malware? Um, at the end of the day, it's a malicious software that restricts access to your computer or files on your computer until the ransomware is paid. Now, this also takes into consideration that you actually want that data back, right? So the encrypted data that they take ransom from you has to be sensitive enough or proprietary enough that you're willing to pay it back. Now, how does this actually spread? Um, this actually spreads through our cryptobiology, so it's a very fast and uh, effective method to basically dish out a very um, unhealthy dose of, of ransomware. Um, now, basically what this does is it either threatens to leak sensitive information or says, hey, you know, if you don't, if we, we won't leak it, if you pay this X amount of, of ransomware. Now, this also under, this under, uh, this operates under the assumption that the data that, that they've taken from you is actually worthwhile, and most of the time it is, right? So that you're willing to pay it. Now, how do you pay back ransomware? Um, you're not gonna write them a check, they're not gonna cash it, that's, that's too easy for them to get caught. Now, most of the time, how this is actually being done is through Bitcoin or some type of e-currency, Ethereum, uh, something in that field where it's, where there's still a ledger, but it's a lot harder to trace because there's IP masquerading and so on and so forth. So it can really kind of, um, uh, really be very hard to trace that kind of data. Now, this kind of moves me on to the next slide here, um, which is gonna really get us into the other verticals that we're gonna be talking about. Um, if you could for me, May, just one more slide. Perfect. So this leads me into all the verticals. It really doesn't matter where we are, right? You could be in higher education, you could be in the energy sector, healthcare, manufacturing, telecommunications, retail, financial services. Every single vertical is at risk. Um, this isn't a fad, this isn't gonna be going away anytime soon. And as you've seen by May's earlier slides, this is not only ramping up, but ramping up at a very quick pace, right? So uh, even with higher education, right? So let's kind of take this into consideration. Um, with everything that's went on in the last year, year and a half, there's more virtual classrooms that are being taught. Um, so there's more endpoints that are out there for easier access. There's more actual just virtual classrooms to attend than ever before. Um, so all of that data has to be kept safe and ransomware proof, not only there, but also in the, the financial sector. The financial sector is, is really fighting on two fronts. The new front of, hey, there's always gonna be a new law, a new way to do things. So they're always trying to keep up on that, but also the threat uh, to their environment and these crazy ecosystems that these financial institutions have. Um, outside of that is manufacturing, right? So not only are they getting targeted at their logistics side, right? So they're trying to, to capture their logistics load and, and understanding that, but they're also going after their intellectual properties. What really makes that manufacturing company very valuable. Once they can steal that, they send it off and, and they can reproduce the manufacturing stuff, right? Um, next is retail. Uh, I can't tell you how many times in the last year I've now bought you know, instead of the brick and mortar uh, going store to store and really, you know, walking everywhere, um, 2020 has really showed us that you can really buy anything from sitting on your couch. Uh, I, I assume most of you guys know this by now, but I think I've done more retail shopping uh, in 2020 sitting on my couch than ever before. And that also leads open availability for, for other things, right? So not only, and I'll, I'll talk, talk about some common affection uh, approaches here next, but this really goes hand in hand with that. So you're gonna see like malvertising, SMS texting, um, anything that gets your attention to go buy more stuff. 
Now, this also leads me into the healthcare, right? So healthcare, how much information do you give when you go to the doctor, right? All this information has to be very proprietary and, and HIPAA compliant and, and also very, very, very secure. Um, so this is where ransomware, it, it can get into any sector at any vertical. It really doesn't matter where you're at in this particular spectrum, you can be affected uh, no matter where you are. Um, now, this kind of leads me into talking about some common infection approaches, which is actually going to be on the next slide, if you could for me, May. No problem. Thank you. All right, so some of the common infection approaches. Now, let's kind of talk about this in a very holistic view. Most of the time, you've ever probably heard about some infections. You've probably heard of the word like Trojan horse or malware or some type of exe software right so what is what is a trojan or what is a trojan horse so a trojan horse is mostly common it's the most common attack vector so think of email attachments uh, what this really is is a malicious macro that's attached to these emails um, that basically say hey if you want to spend you know 30 minutes talking to the C COO please click here to sign up for these particular times or hey can you fix this time punch if you're in HR right um, there's a whole bunch of ways that they do not only um, uh, malicious macros but basically social engineering to a degree trying to make you stumble and click these links so that way you actually fall for it now, removable media, this is, to be brutally honest, the simplest way to infect a user's uh, either network or their personal computer really kind of depends where that is. Um, now, what's really cool about this and what I found really cool is Google and actually two uh, U.S. Uh, universities dropped a USB stick in public, right? Um, and, and what it did is it triggered human curiosity. As us as people, we're very curious. We want to know if there's a million dollars laying on that thing, right? Um, is there something, is, the, is, is there a key that will unlock success? That's usually the main reason that we're, we're trying to stumble for something. Um, now, with 49% of people actually grabbing and plugging it into a computer, um, that's really huge. I have no problem with somebody plugging in to their computer as long as it's in a virtual sandbox or some type of segregated network. That way, everything stays segregated, no internet access. Because what really happens um, if that was a, a malicious software or a, a malicious act, what will happen is as soon as you plug it in, you make it a trusted device, and then the computer says, hey, whatever you want, you got, right? Um, so if you need to reach out to the internet, you can't. And what usually happens at the particular time, especially with you know some type of uh, a, a toolkit or ex exploit, what it does is it reaches out to a ransomware server and then says, hey, I have a whole bunch of data for you. And then it, it, it can do a couple different things, it either sends packets back or sends the data uh, vice versa. Now, let's also talk about malvertising. Malvertising is something that you'll see uh, throughout the entire year, but you really see the attackers really step it up around, you know, Christmas time, right? So you'll really see it throughout the holidays. And what they really do is they compromise weak infrastructures. Uh, these weak infrastructures are legitimate advertisement servers um, like, you know, Amazon, uh, Google, eBay, anything that's actually legit. And what they actually do is they say, hey, you click on the ad and instead of going to www.amazon.com, it actually goes to an unlegitimate website um, that, that looks very similar, but it's actually just not the same feel, right? So it's just not them. Um, and then what happens, you put in your information, you send it off, you're thinking you're getting this package in a couple of days and the package never arrives. Uh, now what? Now you're looking back and you're like, hey, that's that's a weird charge. That doesn't look like a, you know, an eBay or an Amazon charge. It has a different LLC attached to it. Um, and then you'll notice that, hey, it looks like you've been breached. Um, and, you know, even worse could happen. Your, your information is now in the dark web. Now, let's also talk about some uh, social media and SMS. I get these all the time. Um, so SMS text, so think of anything that's just a short script to your phone. And what I mean by that, it's like a quick link. It's a, usually a, for iPhone users, it's going to be a blue link. And it says like, click here to win your free cruise ship or, uh, you know, whatever that may be. And I get these all the time. A lot of times you'll really be able to catch them. Um, one, I don't sign up for cruise ship vacations, so I know I don't sign up for them. But a lot of times that you'll, you'll notice this is because things are misspelled. It doesn't have proper grammar. Everything seems a little rushed. It doesn't have the right proper format. 
and and overall the fit and finish isn't just there. So those are for the ones that you know are very easy to spot. Now there's also going to be some JavaScripts that are very very keen and, and typed out professionally, uh, and this kind of leads me into ransomware as a service. So ransomware as a service has really gave vast affiliate networks. Um, the availability to reach more people. Um, what they do is they deploy manage or almost uh, anyone can do this, but um, they go to the dark web, they find a, a ransomware as a service provider, right? Uh, and then they can start to start to try to encrypt or pay for encryptions of certain data sets. Um, and this has really made it very scary because it doesn't take an IT savvy person anymore to be able to do ransomware. It's just, hey, I need, you know, let's set up some, you know, you transfer your, your currency in some type of uh, e-currency to them, uh, very untraceable. They're still a ledger, yes, of course, but the IP masquerading and other things kind of do, do some of those, those tunnels. And what happens is it really blocks the, the person that's getting it from, and they all fall back to that ransomware as a service. So again, you don't have to be very keen or very IT savvy to make that happen. So that's, that's one of the craziest parts about it. Now, let's actually go on to the next slide here and kind of look at what, what is next. So what I'm really gonna be talking about is gonna be all systems are a go. What does this really mean? So most of what I've been talking about um, is kind of around the, the Windows side of the world, right? So this is, you know, your, your Windows servers, your Windows PCs, right? But we haven't really talked about Linux, so we really haven't talked about Mac. But as you know, there's no way that they don't have particular issues. Um, now, for instance, uh, on the Linux kill disk, this used to be uh, for a Ubuntu and a whole bunch of other uh, particular uh, versions of Linux, um, we're having this particular issue. Uh, and if you read that box, it basically says, hey, we are sorry, but you're, but you're basically encrypted. Uh, and if you don't wanna lose the, your data, pay 222 Bitcoin. Um, just to give you a little sense how much money 222 Bitcoin is, I think the average Bitcoin is going for about 40K right now. Quick math says that's about $8.8 .8 million, right? So this might be a little bit of uh, a little bit of older of a snapshot, but the, the same still applies, right? They're still coming after you with bit currency or some type of e-currency, as I should say. Uh, and, and, and also, let me also notate this. Just because you pay the money doesn't necessarily mean you're getting the data back. Or if you get the data back, doesn't mean it's not encrypted. Or, or if you pay the money, is you might get the data back, it might be corrupted, and you're gonna have to pay again in a week or two because they made another EXE inside of there, so they're gonna let you rebuild and capture all that data again. So really making sure that you have some of these verticals that we'll talk about in just a second um, set up to really make sure that that doesn't happen. It's going to be keen. Um, next is for Mac. So this really kind of is very, very simple. Uh, file decoder for ransomware messages. Um, basically, hey, this is how you pay it. And it's the same thing. It, what this really is trying to, to get across, it doesn't matter where you live and what is your ecosystem. It doesn't matter if you're in a Mac ecosystem, a full-blown Linux ecosystem with XFS and all the cool repositories and everything that goes along with Linux or if you're in a Windows environment, right? It, they're all still vulnerable. Now, what I really wanna show you next is gonna be kind of malware or, or malware and ransomware and how it actually affects people uh, going forward. So what I wanna do next is actually um, just be able to show you mal or malware um, in, in real time. And if you could for me, mate, could you hit the next slide for me, please? Perfect. So what this is gonna show is malware service, right? So basically what happens right here is it says, hey, you want a new feature, everything looks legitimate, right? So everything from Microsoft Anti-Spam Pro, like for instance, who doesn't want anti-spam? I know I want anti-spam, so I'm gonna look at this email, right? Hey, it looks like everything looks legit, they spelled my name right, you know, everything has proper grammar. It doesn't look like there is an actual issue. Not to mention that everything looks legitimate from up here. They have the Microsoft logo. Nothing, again, is misspelled. And that is really one of the crucial things 
um, for, and this would be kind of chopped up to be like a social engineering side one where they're trying to get your information by you leaking it yourself. Now, let's just pretend you're going down this rabbit hole and you're like, hey, I want Anti-Spam Pro, everything looks legitimate, and then you follow this link. So what the next one is actually gonna show us here, and if you could, for me, may hit one or two forward, um, basically what this is gonna show is it's gonna ask for an off token. Now, at this off token, what are you giving up? There is, and to be honest, this is very normal. Um, this this particular step of feature set, um, from stepping up to hey, I want something, to giving them access, it's very normal inside of the Microsoft world or that platform. But but what you're giving up is, if you notice, access your data anytime. Sign in as you. So now they can basically uh, be you know a malicious insider and, and pretend that it's you. Now they can also see your calendar, your contacts. They can also send mail as as of you. But the most important one is read and write access to your mail. Basically, what that what is that? That's basically you just gave them full administration rights or god level rights to your email box. And guess what? You're probably going to forget about it. It's going to go dormant. And the, actually, the next slide here, if you could for me, May, is going to show you what's going to happen um, once you do this. Uh, so basically, what's going to happen is the malware is going to start to encrypt, right? So boom, you might be like, hey, I'm going to close out of Office 365 today. Something looks a little funky. I'm going to reboot it and see if it was just something was, was awry, right? And then you're going to go, hey, there's maybe it just got transferred into another language. You're going to go down this rabbit hole of wondering why your email looks like this. And then you're going to go, huh, well, maybe there's something wrong. It does say everything's infected. And what kind of email do you think is going to be coming next? If you could for maybe hit one more, please. And then you're going to get something like this, an email that says, hey, it looks like you've been encrypted. Everything is now plain as day. Um, but you're going to have to pay the ransomware fee or um, you know, you're not gonna be able to get your data back. So what do you wanna do? Um, most of the time, uh, this is where we start to start to look into backup softwares or already having a backup available so we can go back to point in time states and actually remediate this issue. But a lot of times, you, again, so they're paying in some type of e-currency. And, and one thing I really wanna drive home is there's gonna be some new legislation coming up that's saying, hey, you have to be ready for this. You are now, you have to be ready for this particular type of infection or this particular type of exploit because you have to keep going. You can't be paying the bad guys. We don't, we basically, you know, we, we say we don't want to, you know, mess with traders or, or that kind of side of the house. So actually what I want to move into here next is going to be, you know, what does the preparedness look like? If you could for me, May, if you hit one or two more slides, that would be perfect. Um, I really want to show uh, everybody how we get into some of the preparedness of all this. Now, the first couple I'm going to drill into um, are, are very simple, and I feel like every single company out there in the wide spectrum can do this. Um, one, keeping all of your software up to date. I can't tell you the amount of times that I used to be, when I used to be an admin, to see software that's not just one or two patches behind, but maybe even multiple big patches behind security patches and that particular company has that for all of their remote employees at that time right now it's, it's even more important to have your all of your software up to date you have all your employees for the most part probably working at home or some type of remote office robo location something like that um and, and not just that so keeping software up to date and now we're not leveraging most of the time i would say you know, a VPN back to on-site. So that virtual private network. We're really, you know, relying on some of these, these uh, your end users, network infrastructures to also be protected. But if that's not protected and the software is not protected, boom, they're in like nobody's business, right? Now, I think this is also one of the biggest things that a company can do. And this is something that, you know, you could even task your IT professionals that you guys currently have, or maybe even bring in a third party to do this, is actually perform a, a security threat analysis with your team. What is this called? It's called a, a penetration test. What does this really look at? Basically, it finds all your vulnerabilities that you guys have currently today, that you guys have that's open. This could be from anywhere from training your staff 
to you know making sure they're not click happy and clicking on every single thing to hey it looks like you had some firewall rules that need to be locked down you have some ports on your firewall that were wide open and now they can they can see network traffic and start to start to be the intermediary right and, and just doing these particular tests we're going to show you you yourself the company your vulnerabilities and what you can do to actually get around them uh, and then uh, not just that number three is training your staff right I think this is the majority of where things usually go awry is end users, right? So somebody going out there and just click happy through email and they didn't even know they clicked on it, but it had a malicious, a malicious you know, software on the back end that attached to their computer, then attached to something else. And then it just gets inside of the network infrastructure and there it goes, right? But that particular employee or end user never really knew that that was a thing. So having your employees know what malware looks like, know what a phishing attack and social engineering look like is gonna be very keen to keep you success. Now also informing employees or everybody inside the company if a virus reaches the company network. I think this is probably one of the most important things I know there's a lot of companies out there that don't like to do this because they don't like to say, hey, we've been hit. But I really think it gives you, the company, and your employees a leg up. Now you might have some of those end users that are just click happy going through emails or click happy going through anything else. Um, they're going to take a, a maybe a second look. Maybe this might actually in turn some maybe some more uh, some more help desk tickets. This might be potential spam. But I would take that all day, every day over another a Trojan horse or some type of crazy exploit in there and messing things up. Now, the last four and five, these are going to be absolutely critical, mission critical, as I, I, I really should put them in, up in the forefront. But uh, backing up all your information every day, right? I think this is very simple, uh, but I think this is absolutely necessity for actually making sure that everything outside of the spectrum is packed up. So let's just pretend, let's take this into a little bit of a, a different uh, a spear here, right? So let's just pretend it's last week, uh, Monday you got tasked with writing a COO documentation uh, and you need to present it to, to basically all the VIPs at your company, right? So you spend all week, you have it drilled down, Thursday, Friday, you have it narrowed down and you really are set in stone, you have everything done and it took you 30, 30, 40 hours to make this crazy awesome PowerPoint deck that's gonna make you look like a genius. And then guess what happens Saturday? Uh, an exploit comes in back and, and you don't have a backup backing you up every day. You just lost a week worth of work and now Monday morning rolls around and you have to have that meeting at nine o'clock? Guess what? Guess who's, who's you know in the hot seat? It's gonna be you, right? So making sure that those ba that information is backed up is really gonna be key. Now. This also leads me into number five, which is backing up your information to a secure and off-site location. So it's awesome to have a secure location to go to, uh, but having an off-site location is gonna be where, you know, uh, I would, I would kind of say the bees and E's, right? So making sure that you have complete, uh, you know, a golden ticket at the end of the day that says, hey, even if something happens to my on-prem repository, uh, something happens, I have a malicious insider, my admin goes rogue, or I just heard the other day, hey, you know, I had a disgruntled employee and he took a baseball bat to our backup server. Guess what? As long as you had new cloud in there and you you could do that, we could send it to the Cloud Connect. We could send it to an offsite repository, allowing for you guys to have that uh, that really that peace of mind outside of the wire or outside of your local on-prem network, and that you could that you could uh, that you know that it's reachable and attainable to ground. Now, really what I want to talk about next, and, and I, I'll talk about it just a little bit here. Uh, if May, if you could actually hit the, the next slide for me, please. What we're going to be talking about next is, is really called the 3 two, one rule. Uh, now, the 3 two, one rule is really going to be uh, a monstrous uh, for what we're really looking to do. Um, and, and this is very crucial to exactly um, the business needs that everybody has. Um, uh, could you hit the next slide for me again, May? Thank you. Um, what this is going to do um, in the three, two, one rule is, and, and let me kind of talk very high level. So the very basics of three, two, one um, is three different copies of your data, two different forms of media, one offsite, usually in a cloud, right? And then one is offline. That one we like to call air gaps. Um, and then at the end of the day, that's three, two, one, one. We here at Beam even like to throw another zero in there. 
Um, what this really indicates is zero errors for backup and recovery. So if you make sure to do this, right? So you have you have three different copies of your data. Let's just say you have um uh, you have a backup copy job, you have a regular job, and you have just different copies of this data, right? So you have active full. Now two different media types, whether this be you know spinning disk. Hey, I have you know I have a hard drive that it's on and it's spinning on, and I also have a tape infrastructure, or I have you know different types of media a usb drive an nvme drive something that you can actually you know different ways to retain or move this data correspondingly is really going to be keen here now really next is going to be which one is off site um, now what this is really going to be talking about um, is is basically the the availability to be able to move the data offsite to an offsite location and then the one it really drills down to one offline location so think of like immutable backups right so having something offline air gaps can't be touched after it's there that's going to be the tape infrastructure now really what i want to touch on next is what's called the backup copy job so a backup copy job, let me kind of work from the left to the right here. Um, so what we're going to be uh, seeing here on the left, this is going to be your, your hypervisor. So you have a VMware or Hyper-V, you have virtual machines sitting on top. Uh, and then here in the middle, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but what it's showing is being backup and replication. And what it's doing is it's, this is a proxy. So when you hear a proxy, this is basically the data mover for Beam. Um, this is gonna say, hey, I need to reach out to the data store down here and understand exactly what's going on. And if you could for me, May, this is actually gonna give out a very cool diagram of actually how a backup copy job is done. It shows the A blocks and the C blocks moving around. Uh, and this is gonna show you how we can actually do that. As you see here, they actually put them into an active full and then it moves to a new cloud repository or an offsite repository, right? Wherever that may be. Now, we're also gonna do that one more time and that's gonna show us exactly what it is gonna do again on another backup copy job. And then we'll, it'll also show what's called grandfather, father, son. So there's actually some build out to this slide. If you could for me, May, could you hit it two more times, please? Perfect. So this is basically saying, hey, we're going to be pushing this to the cloud, right? So this is going to be over going over the wire, and this is going to be landing in the cloud repository. So boom, now what do we have there? We have now two full. And then the last but definitely not least is going to be one more, and this is going to be for GFS. And GFS, what this really boils down to is grandfather, father, son. Um, now, what is grandfather, father, son? Think of that as long-term archival. So think of, hey, I have weeklies, I have monthlies, and I have yearlies, and I want to keep those for a different parameter um, than everything else. And that's how you can do so. Um, we can make it very granular inside of Beam. Now, the, really the next thing I really want to talk about is going to be Cloud Connect. Um, and May, if you could hit the next slide for me, please. I appreciate that. Um, so Cloud Connect, um, and let me give you a high level. It's going to be very, very similar to the slide that you're looking at here today, um, except Cloud Connect is now going to be in the mix. So what is Cloud Connect? So again, on the left-hand side, you have your Veeam backup and replication server sitting in the middle. You have VMware Hyper-V with your virtual machine sitting on top, proxy in the middle, and then your storage repository here. You got your little cloud. And if you could for me make, there's it's actually gonna be quite a little bit of build out for me. Perfect. This is gonna show a lot of different feature sets that we can kind of talk here to today. Now, what I wanna show about is this is the cloud gateway. It looks like a little gate. Um, this is your on-prem. So you're, this is your customer production site. So as a customer, uh, and then this is new cloud networks, right? So you have your, your cloud or your, um, sorry, your cloud gateway. Uh, and this is the repository, C1, C2, C3, and C4. What that really is breaking down is just different layers of blocks um, because every single time we do a backup, it's technically called a block level backup. And we're looking at data blocks. So it's, you know, there's a lot of different variables to this, um, but this really just shows a whole bunch of different things. Now, if you could for me one more time, uh, hit the slide advance, and this is gonna show you basically how we can do this with WAN acceleration. WAN acceleration is another thing that we can get into. WAN acceleration at the very high level um, is basically how we take somebody that doesn't have a great MEG pipe, so their wire on print isn't the greatest, but what we can do is we can have like a cache. So basically, this little bubble is a cache, uh, and it sends it over to the, WAN, uh, the cloud gateway, and then we also have one 
on the Cloud Connect side. So they bundle together. You got you got to have you can't have one without the other. All right, perfect. And this is going to next our next slide is actually going to be talking about a little bit about replication. So let's actually get a little bit into the replication side of the house. Um, which is very, very cool. So there's a couple different things that I really want to talk about here, um, which is how does it work? What is WAN acceleration? Again, this is very optional, uh, and, and, and I should say that it, WAN acceleration only really works uh, for the clients that are having really bad MIG pipes. Um, so again, so it's somebody that's, you know, not necessarily flying off the roofs. They might not have like a 10 gigabit or even a one gigabit network, something that's really slow, you know, maybe 100 by 100 or, or less. Uh, WAN acceleration is really going to help. So this is going to be able to say, hey, basically, what is crowd replication? We can use WAN acceleration to do that. But again, um, this is just showing, hey, we can move this, these virtual machines, replicate them over the wire to the cloud. In this particular case, it's going to be new cloud, right? Uh, and then these are going to be the virtual machines on a ready, on standby. They're powered off right now. Uh, but these virtual machines are still on. So let's just say you lose virtual machine number four, and, it, and then you need to turn it on. You just go over here, left click power on, and your virtual machine is on. So there's a couple different options that we can really be tasked with next. Now, on the next slide here that I really want to talk about um, is going to be called insider protection. So what is insider protection? This is something that the service providers, as in new cloud, can really help with with keeping your backup um, even safer than what you thought for just an offsite uh, backup. These, this is really truly how you can make sure, even if you have a rogue admin. So let's just say you have an admin, you had to let him go, he's very disgruntled, and he tried to purge, or maybe he did purge every single backup that you guys had. Um, so now on your on-prem repository, you're like, great, I have no on-prem repository uh, to fall back to. Um, now, what is this insider protection going to be doing? So what does this do is basically, and let me read this to you, it says added tenant information, so that's you, uh, protection to insiders, right? So basically what this will do, it will preserve all deleted backups for a set a number of days. This might be 14 days, it could be 30 days, it could be 140 days. It really just depends what you're looking to accomplish there. But what this is really going to be talking about Hey, you have an extra layer of security even if something happens on prem, malicious insider, if something goes rogue. All right. So next, I really want to get into on the next slide is going to actually be some some actually data protection tips, um, and that's really what we're going to get into in what's called um, you know rotated drives or uh, you know or this really how do we protect this right? So a physical server, whether it's Linux or Windows, um, having it having non-domain membership right uh, making sure it's just not domain to the joint or to, to joined to the domain is really going to be crucial right so making sure that you know it's not seen by every other domain controller um having different cred uh, credentials i think this is very very keen um this is where you know setting up longer passwords and maybe some very intricate and very detailed passwords at this particular step could be mission critical now you know, you could always use a password manager, especially if you make these very, very crazy and hectic. Personally, that's what I do. Um, I go to the internet and I have the internet make me the craziest password, especially for firewalls, anything like that. Um, and then also just keeping local accounts and firewalls on uh, and, and, and everything just needs to be segregated, right? Um, next is going to be direct attached storage. Um, now, offline except for scheduled backup windows, um, this could be a limitation of the server that you have. That is that is a stipulation just depending where you're at in the OS build. Definitely, I could see that done. Now, you could always build a PowerShell script to overcome that. Now, a mechanism to turn the system on, uh, I think that is also mission critical as well. Now, what I really want to talk about here next is actually going to be stronger passwords. So that's actually going to be on our next slide here for me, May. Um, what I really want to talk about um, is just, again, really kind of get into more of the intricate details. Again, very high level, but they are some intricate details. Uh, Windows credentials, 
again, either domain or local uh, account. In this particular uh, uh, section, I'm not going to say from the domain, uh, just because we're really being uh, talking about security here. I really would like that local to the host of some kind, right? Something that's very one-off, not on the domain. Um, your Veeam Cloud Connect credentials. These are actually supplied by your service provider. Uh, and most of the time, these are very, very strong passwords. Um, with a very complex key. But again, you're only putting in this key maybe once or twice and you never have to do it again. You go out, you save it with all your other uh, encrypted keys and you go on and go, go out and uh, do your thing. Now, Linux credentials, Linux account or Linux private key, I'm always gonna lean more to the Linux private key uh, just because that's uh, in my personal head. That's how you do things in Linux. You have everything. You you don't want a Linux private key or nothing. Uh, you could you obviously have to have an account, uh, but you know that that key is really going to be uh, very good. Now integrated storage accounts. Uh, this may be Dell Data Domain, XGrid, HP Store One. Um, you know anything like that. Some of those are actually deduplicating storage appliances, so they do double duty. Um, and then lastly, but definitely not least, is credentials for your SMB share. So really managing those share credentials could be very vital and crucial for everything that's actually happening. Now, actually what's next is just gonna be mixed repositories. Uh, so I'm not gonna drill too much into that. Mixed repositories really at the end of the day are just Linux or Windows. So I'm not gonna spend too much time. Uh, now, what I do wanna talk about next is actually gonna be VLAN segregation. Um, now, what is VLAN segregation? These are basically uh, vast networks designed to harvest data from Active Directory and traverse the network. So basically what that means in simplistic terms is there's a there's two different networks designed for different things. They do contact, do, they do talk to the same particular uh, Active Directory domain controller, uh, but there's different ways to do it. Now, if a workstation is infected, which most likely is the circumstance, uh, this could help them, them spread, right? Or stem the spread, I should say, uh, not help them spread. Uh, because if you're on different VLANs, so think of different VLANs as kind of like different neighborhoods on the same street. Uh, you have all these different cul-de-sacs, but not necessarily cul-de-sac A is gonna bleed into cul-de-sac B. It's kind of the same just with the networking inside of the, the, the equation here as well. I'm just trying to paint that really vivid picture. Now, this can especially be notable for uh, crypto worms. Uh, crypto worms, this is a whole other topic and I don't wanna to get too, too far into it, but at the end of the day, what is a crypto worm? If this is something that leeches or worms through an environment or through a network, literally eating everything in its path. It's not actually eating. It's just taking in the information that it thinks is proprietary and, and, and what it can use as systematic uh, advances and then starts to basically appear more and more and more. All right. So let's actually talk about the uh, ransomware remediation and recovery options, um, which kind of leads me right into the next one, which is going to be, hey, what should we do, right? Um, now, you're, you're always going to hear, oh, you know, it's probably from a, not an IT professional, you'll hear, just pay the ransomware, you know, you're pay, pay, you know, pay the fee. But again, this doesn't guarantee that your data, one, is going to come back great, uh, not encrypted or not with another exploit in it. So that's not really the, the best way to do that, um, nor would I advise to really pay a ransomware fee. Realistically, you should be in the middle box. Restore back to an uncompromised data location, right? So going back a point in time state saying, hey, it looks like a ransomware got in on Thursday. We're gonna revert back to Wednesday, midday, boom. And then also just lo locate or basically get in contact with the fraud prevention or your crime prevention team that's local in your area, uh, really making sure that they're aware of everything that's going on. Um, and then also one other thing that I really want to talk about, touch on is, is the secure restore, which is actually going to be on the next slide here. But what is a secure restore? Very good question. So what this really does is this mitigate basically the cleanup uh, to a degree. So let's kind of work from left to right here. So the file downloads and sits stagnant in the file system, right? So boom, it's, it's in your file server, it's in your NAS, it's on your, you know, your, your laptop, right? The exploit has now created a leveraged download file. So basically what it does is it's been backed up. Now what happens is day zero. The backup, right, now it's infected. 
the launch is now attacked. It knows it's in the window of the backup period. Now your antivirus or your AV becomes aware. Um, hopefully there's a signature building and everything else is kind of going on in the back end. Uh, you're getting out to with different vendors, making sure that that's the per, per, the right AV and the right signature for you guys. Uh, the AV software releases a signature that says, hey, looks like everything is, uh, uh, is uh, basically good now. Uh, and then clean up, they, uh, clean up with the backup and restore, right? What is this? At the end of the day, this is an isolated environment to perform the latest antivirus test and definition scan against the backup. So what does this do? It kind of makes a, 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 a sandbox, right? So a virtual network inside of that, puts in your backup, does an AV scan, makes sure there's no uh, lingering bits or bites of that particular virus around, and then says, hey, you see that you're all golden or your AV goes, hey, you still got some work to do. So it kind of depends what you've got there. Now, on the next one here is going to be endpoint devices and the non-virtualized systems. What this really comes down to um, is going to be the, the Veeam agent for Linux. Um, the Veeam agent for Linux makes it easy to follow and recommend the offsite location for what we already kind of talked about, air gaps and the 3 two, one rule. Uh, this is due to the integration. So it doesn't matter, like I said earlier, if it's a Windows or a Linux agent. We can really get very granular with this. So we can do backup copy jobs, move the files, get that, those actual data sets offsite to a different location. And, and actually moving on next is actually going to be the Microsoft Windows side, right? So the Windows side is actually just going to be able to, just like anything else, uh, is going to be able to show you the, the actual log of what's going on, um, which is really cool. So this is going to show, hey, day two, all good. Day or uh, this is actually showing when it's going to the cloud, which is really cool. Uh, but you get your statuses in, and everything else. All right. So um, one of the last things I really want to touch on is going to be the 24-hour uh, real-time monitoring, uh, which is going to be with Beam One. Uh, Beam One. What is this? So Beam One is probably one of the the coolest things that Beam uh, Beam offers. There's a lot of different things that you can do. There's over 200 baked in reports, preset alarms, um, possible ransomware monitoring, a spike in CPU usage, uh, you know, latency, uh, latency uh, time parameters. Hey, there's a backup job that normally gets kicked off at, you know, one o'clock in the morning, but now it's getting kicked off at, you know, one in the afternoon and it's drawing a lot more bandwidth and it's going to a different location that I'm not used to. It reports on RPO, RTO. SLAs, right? So meeting those particular thresholds, knowing that you're protected is very keen. And then also it resolves the issues very quickly because you're so enveloped, you're so all the way around immersed inside of this environment, um, everything is going to be a lot more beneficial. So at this point in time, I'm going to actually pass it back over to May, one of our Platinum VCSP partners over at NewCloud. And uh, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Um, so you guys, just based off of what Michael was talking about, the key takeaway here is that NewCloud works close with Veeam to offer your company total ransomware protection. So we do this by combining Veeam software with our ultra-low latency cloud network, um, and this allows you to really create secure, encrypted, and automated backups of your data while getting them off-site quickly and then pulling them back to you when you need them. And so with replication, you can really get granular with your restoration and isolate compromised files and recover the rest of your data. Okay, I want to take a step back quickly and give you some context of who NewCloud is for those of you who might be unfamiliar with us. Um, so we're a cloud services provider. We've been in business since 1988. Our background is in networking and we've evolved several times over the years to adjust our offerings according to the changes in technology. And so, as such, we've amassed over a 1,000 customers in the U.S. and in Europe. And as Michael said, we are platinum-level partners with Veeam, and we were one of the very first partners to launch Cloud Connect with Veeam. So, we've really built a reputation for quality within our industry, and our SLA and customer satisfaction rating do a very good job of exemplifying that. All right. So, this map is a breakdown of our nationwide ultra-low latency cloud network. So this network is designed and built for backup and disaster recovery. So when we, back, when we talk about backup and disaster recovery, it's important to have your data far enough away from your main site so that it won't be affected by the same natural disaster, but it's close enough so that it's usable when you actually need to stand up those VMs. And so New Cloud, we control the bandwidth and the latency between all of these locations to ensure that the customer's data is always usable. 
So if your customer is hit by ransomware, or if your excuse me, if your company is hit by ransomware, this means that we can get your backups and replicas back to you quickly, and that helps eliminate downtime. All right. And so we work hand in glove with Veeam to bring our customers best in breed solutions. So we have the variety of Veeam offerings that we support. Our engineers are Veeam certified and they implement technology very fast. And so we offer the full suite of Veeam backups and disaster recovery services. At New Cloud Networks, we believe that great technology is powered by great people. We're always being asked what sets us apart from the likes of Amazon and Microsoft and our answer is always the same. We believe in personalized service, not a 1-800 number. Our customers can always rest assured that we have top engineers available to them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And we know that no two companies are the same, so we don't believe in cookie cutter kind of cloud solutions. And we work closely with our customers to ensure we develop solutions that address their core business needs. And then we implement these solutions using best in breed technology solutions. And we're able to provide our solutions at a really affordable price. So basically the bottom line is that we believe in taking care of our customers. I wanna thank everyone today for joining the webinar. Um, Michael and I hope you learned a lot about ransomware preparedness and recovery. Remember the most important thing is that you're never exempt from an attack. Your company will face something like this in the near future. But by being proactive and preparing for everything can all make all the difference in the world for your company. So what's next? Well, you've heard a lot about New Cloud and Veeam, and we'd love to talk to you about your unique business needs and understand how we can help you. We also have a free trial available for those of you who are interested in kind of kicking the tires and testing the features of our backup service. And as always, you can reach out to Michael or myself with any questions you might have after this webinar. And with that, I'd like you to uh, use the question feature on your screen and submit any questions you might have. Let's see here. All right. First question I've got is, if I have a file server corrupted with ransomware, is my only option to stand up in a new cloud networks data center? Good question. So you can restore from backup either on your side or a new cloud network if you're backing up a VMware environment. Okay, next question is, I've heard that ransomware can affect more than production and also backups. Can new cloud networks and Veeam protect that? So ransomware can affect all backups or production machines. That's why it's important to keep backups in more than one place. And that's also why it's important to keep usernames and logins separate from backup storage and production. All right. Good question. Um, does New Cloud Networks offer a free trial? Yes, the trial will be up to 20 terabytes for 30 days. And how is the solution priced out? So we price it uh, per gigabyte per month. Next question. Let's see. Oh, how fast can I spin up a cloud connect environment in a new cloud data center? Great question. So this depends on the size of the data set and if the customer is using Cloud Connect or Cloud Connect replication. And what sort of resources will I require on site to manage the Cloud Connect transition and upkeep? I think, Michael, you probably could answer that a little bit better than I could. Yeah, absolutely. So just talking about resources, um, it, we're not resource intensive or a resource hog whatsoever. Um, bare minimum standards for usually about all the software is about four cores uh, and then eight gigs of RAM and a 500 meg install file. Um, now, this does need to be on a Windows box, so our actual like VVR, Veeam Backup and Replication Servers, uh, Office 365, all that kind of stuff does need to be uh, still spun up on a Windows box. Now, the latest or the farthest back that will go, I guess I should say, is a 2008 R2 SP1 or above. As long as you're above that, the newer flavors of Windows, the better, 16, 12, 19, uh, anything is better than 2008 just because it's about to be sunsetted, uh, if not already. Uh, so that's really about all the resources that Veeam's requiring, um, you know, off the, off the top. Awesome. Um, we have another question that came in. How does Office 365 backups play into this scenario? Yeah, very good question. So Office 365, um, it, there, it, 
it's not done uh, the same way that Veeam Backup and Replication is done or Cloud Connect uh, is done. Uh, there's really two main different ways. It's either you buy the, the basically having a uh, new cloud go out there and actually uh, pulling the data down for you, or you have one on-prem that you're kind of fully in control of. Um, and then what we do is we really target the the Azure data stores um, because since they are up in Azure, your O365 data is technically with Azure, uh, we just target the data stores that reside up there, pulling all the data down um, and making sure that you have a valid backup for O365 along with your, your actual infrastructure, your network, your virtual machines and everything else. And we make that full spectrum connectivity um, all the way around. Awesome. Um, and then we've got one more question that came in from Joey Watson. How does your solution protect us from the, tr uh, the treat of our data being leaked? Yeah, very, very good question. So uh, being leaked is basically the same thing as ransomware, to be brutally honest. So um, there's there's really no difference between an exploit that's going to leak it and an exploit that's going to say, uh, hey, I actually want to keep it for a monetary value. It's going to be the same way that we would do it any other way. Um, so it really comes down to one security practices on prem, uh, making sure that you have a three to one backup scenario. Uh, in play. And if not just three, two, one, three, two, one, one, uh, plus a zero, making sure that we have an offsite location. We have an offline location of this data. That way, if something gets in and it's long term, that you still have a backup from a year ago or six months ago that to go back to. Um, so that's really how we're going to be able to protect you is with a backup strategy, making sure that these faults uh, don't get shown uh, before before you're ready. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. I don't see any other questions come in. Um, but as always, you can, um, if you guys have any other questions that come up, feel free to reach out to Michael or myself. Um, and we really appreciate you guys attending today's webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.